Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, Jeffrey is president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. He also hosts We the People, a weekly podcast of constitutional debate. He's a professor of law at George Washington University, and he's a contributing editor at The Atlantic. He's a graduate of Harvard College, Oxford University, and Yale Law School. He has had essays and commentaries everywhere, such as the New York Times, New Republic, New Yorker. And he is the author of seven previous books, including his most recent book, The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. And uh, that's what we talk about in this conversation. We start by talking about the the impact, uh, generally, that classical writers had on the Founding Fathers, why studying the influences of of the Founding Fathers is important. We talk about the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and then we kind of go through um, many of the, the big figures. So we talk about Franklin and the impact of Pythagoras on his thinking. Uh, John Adams on humility. Thomas Jefferson as a complicated figure with many of the things that he was uh, thinking in one way and then living another way. We discuss uh, Washington's self-mastery, Hamilton and Madison on moderation politically, and uh, many other topics. I really found this conversation super important, super illustrative of the things that were impacting the Founding Fathers and and ways in which I think the American public should probably take many lessons on how to to live their own lives. So it's it's, uh, very, very uh, wonderful, though, the work that Jeffrey's done here. And um, I, I, it gave me a, a new perspective on the Founding Fathers, so it's, a, it's a, all very wonderful. As always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so like, subscribe, share, all the things. And uh, now I bring you Jeffrey Rosen. I am here with Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to uh, speaking with you. Thanks. Great to be with you. Me too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You wrote a, you wrote a great book. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, the book is called The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is absolutely wonderful. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool because it's uh, one of those books where it's like, well, you know, people talk a lot about, especially historians, founding fathers and things like that. And, but it's nice to have kind of in one place, all of the thinkers that inspired a lot of the, um, the founding fathers and what the specific ideas were. So we'll get all into it. You, you cover a handful of uh, virtues before we do, uh, just give us the kind of snapshot of, uh, who you are, uh, kind of professionally, academically, and anything that you're currently, uh, up to. I'm Jeff Rosen. I'm the head of the National Constitution Center. I teach law at GW Law School. And what I'm up to is spreading the word about the wonderful classical moral philosophy that inspired <laughs> the founders. Um, uh, shall I tell the, do you, do you want to talk about how I got into this stuff? Because it was a completely unexpected. Uh, yeah, project. yeah, please. Please, yeah, please. So it was during COVID that I noticed two synchronicities that led me uh, to this wonderful literature. I was um, reading about Ben Franklin's 13 Virtues. I knew about his virtue project uh, because I'd practiced his effort to achieve moral perfection, as he put it, with a friend a couple of years ago. Um, We were referred to the Hebrew version of the Franklin project by a rabbi who recommended it as a system of musar or character improvement. And we um, tried it for a while. It involves picking a virtue like temperance or prudence, making an X mark every night where you fall short and um, trying to get better. We tried this for a while. We found it really depressing because there's so many X marks and we gave it up for a while, <laughs> but uh, we felt we were better off for having tried it. During COVID, I, I saw Franklin's project again and was struck by a motto he used from Cicero from the Tusculan Disputations saying, without virtue, happiness cannot be. And then a few weeks later, I was at UVA, and there on the wall of the Boar's Head Inn were 12 virtues that Thomas Jefferson had drafted for his daughters. And they looked a lot like Franklin's. And what really struck me is Jefferson, too, used as a motto for the pursuit of happiness a passage from Cicero's Tusculan Disputations uh, Mm. that essentially says, 
he who is tranquil in mind and is neither overly uh, exuberant or unduly despondent has achieved the tranquility and self-composure that characterizes happiness. So basically, I thought I've got to read Cicero, which I hadn't read, um, mm. and, and then what else to read? And it was discovering a, a, a reading list that Jefferson sent out to kids who were going to law school and, and friends of his when he was old about how to be a rounded person that really transformed my understanding of happiness. Jefferson has a section on ethics that he sometimes calls ethics and sometimes natural religion that mm. includes Cicero's Tusculan disputations and also the on duties. It includes Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus. It also includes Locke's essay concerning human understanding and Hutchison and Kames and Bolingbroke and, and Hume's essays. So basically, I, I set out during COVID to read these works, and I was just so struck that I'd missed them. I've had a wonderful liberal yeah. arts education, history, politics, political philosophy, literature, um, and law, but these works of moral philosophy, classical and enlightenment, had just fallen out of the curriculum by the time I was in college. So that was what uh, I set out to do. And in COVID, I decided to work my way down Jefferson's reading list and, and then turn to the other books in the founding era that contained the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, and that yeah. uh, transformed my understanding of what it means to be a good person and what it means to be a good citizen. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, obviously, application to to be gleaned from from uh, uh, these these writers, and then uh, how how it impacts, you know, how it can impact, you know, everyone. I guess uh, two questions, I guess, I have on this. So uh, the obvious question is, is you know, just generally, you know, how does understanding these influences of these writers, Seneca, Cicero, et cetera, um, how does understanding them and and the impact they had on the founding fathers help us understand kind of the founding documents, how the country was formed, um, et cetera. Uh, how does that give us a, a little bit of a glimpse into, um, you know, behind the scenes of where their thought process was or what they were thinking or what they were trying to, to, um, uh, to, to, to put out here with the, with the new country or, or, you know, the foundations of it? Well, it's absolutely transformative. It both transformed my understanding of how, the founders themselves experienced the quest of trying to be a good person and also how they connected that quest to being a good citizen. First, it's really important that for, for the founders as well as for the uh, ancients, happiness was not feeling good, it was being good. It was not the pursuit mm. of pleasure, but the pursuit of self-mastery, self-discipline, daily self-improvement so we could be our best selves and serve others. And seeing happiness in those terms really changed the way I thought about the founders' daily lives because they talked about this quest constantly. They are describing their own efforts to have industrious reading and writing schedules to moderate their tempers and their diets and their interactions with others. They're often chastising themselves for falling short. And, and most strikingly of all, they're such voracious readers that, that um, up until mm. their 80s, Adams and Jefferson are trading book recommendations about comparative religion and philosophy and much more. So it, it was, um, I, I talk about the effort to get inside of the mind of the founders. And since this literature so shaped their, their moral worldview as kids, and since their parents um, you know, constantly exhorted them to practice this path. Uh, it, it very much defined their own daily life in a very significant way. And then there's mm. a whole uh, other series of insights about how they connected that to good citizenship. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to come to that. I guess the, the second question I had there a little bit is, do you feel that there's, you know, not that we have to kind of stay you know, stuck in one place in time, but do you feel there's an absence or a void of more modern presidents reading or considering these same thinkers? You know, not that it, not that someone has to, but that there's a lot of wisdom there. And do you feel like it's, um, you know, another way of saying this is, you know, that that's a good practice to do that if more leaders, especially, uh, you know, presidents were to read many of the, you know, kind of these, you know, uh, great, you know, scholars and philosophers and, you know, thinkers of our times, 
Um, do you think that things would be different or like have a little bit of perspective or you think that was just kind of a capsule in time at the beginning of the era, early uh, uh, 19th century, late 18th century? How do you feel about it? People are still doing that or leaders still doing that in present day? Well, it's urgently important for all <laughs> Americans to practice this <laughs> quest. I mean, what's so striking is this is not some elite esoteric practice of mm. a few founding fathers. This is the central conception of what it means to be a good person and what it means to be an American for most of our history. It was picked up by Frederick Douglass and uh, Abraham Lincoln, who got it in uh, readers um, on the streets of Baltimore in, in Douglass's case. Phyllis Wheatley mm -hmm. imbibed it as the first great black poet. Um, it was taught to school kids all the way up through the 1950s. I'm, I'm so struck that it was a central part of the main law school textbook in mm. the 19th and early 20th centuries. Middle school and high school kids learned it. It, it, it was what Emerson called the American idea. Uh, mm. And then it just fell out of the curriculum and out of pop culture sometime around mm. the 1950s. So yes, and it's, it's extremely important for leaders to practice it. And it's also important for citizens to mm. master our own emotions and partisanship and anger so that we can choose wise leaders who will avoid becoming demagogues. So this is the, the founder's mm. central fear is that the Republic might not yeah. succeed because both citizens and our leaders wouldn't find the virtuous self mastery or self discipline mm. to engage mm. in the arduous work of personal and political self government. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's super important. I I, I want to come to the personal and political, but there, obviously it's a you know it's a it's a, it's a hallmark feature that many Americans will know. This kind of you know you know uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. This pursuit of happiness is being super central. Um, you talk about in the book about the pursuit is not a feeling or destination, but that it's a it's a journey. Like that's the aim, the pursuit of it, the journey, the experience, the process. That's the aim of it. Uh, and it's always something that's continuing to be improved on. It's not like you you arrive and, and then you're done. Um, talk more about this way of looking at the pursuit of happiness and kind of how the founders were um, experience, or experiencing that for themselves and, and how they wanted to, I guess, in some ways, you know, hold that up as a kind of model for for citizens, both, you know, personally for them and then also politically too. Absolutely. The, the quest is the pursuit as... Cicero said, and, and it's really striking that the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, appears in all of the major sources that inspired the founders, mm. the, the Christian thinkers like Woolitson and Tillotson, Blackstone, the legal thinker, the Whig thinkers like uh, Cato's letters, the civic Republican uh, writers, all use the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, and, and all describe it as the daily task of self-mastery, which requires hourly mindfulness and attention and self-restraint and, and self-improvement. And, and in that sense, by definition, it's not something to be obtained because the quest never ends. Each day, each moment, we have to work to use our powers of reason to temper our unreasonable passions and emotions, to, to use the, the classical framework. By definition, we're all going to fall short uh, all the time, as, as Ben Franklin did in his efforts to achieve moral perfection. He said, you know, I, I never achieved the perfection I sought, but I felt like I was better for having tried. If we, if we use modern words like mindfulness rather than self-mastery, mm -hmm. yeah. then we can view it as a, a, a daily quest, a, a, a practice, a, 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 a habit. Um, a way of life, a, a way of yeah. pursuing the good life, the purpose-driven life that, that involves no fixed destination because the quest is the pursuit, which is the mm. destination, which can never be obtained, but just uh, continually is in reach. And mm. um, that it, it's, the, the founders didn't meditate, but they, they, it's, it's really striking how they drew connections between the Eastern and Western traditions. It just really struck me that John Adams was excited by the idea that Pythagoras may have traveled in the East and, and talked to 
um, the Hindu masters and how excited he was to learn that a translation of the Bhagavad Gita had just been completed by Joseph Priestley, which he thought would show the connections between the East and the West. Um, and viewed in those terms, we can really understand the pursuit of happiness as the quest itself. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, so much of that feels, <laughs> unfortunately, sort of antithetical to kind of, you know, modern society and culture. I mean, obviously, there are many people that are worried about this and people that are trying to live that way. But, you know, I think that there's everything's very, you know, what's the end result? What's the goal? How do you get there? How do you get there the quickest? You know, or what's the next thing? And I think it's, uh, it's, it's an important thing to, to take hold of. You, uh, you spend a, f a little bit of time about Ben Franklin, who's uh, very, very fascinating for a variety of reasons. And so you spend, you know, a, a chapter about him on, on the virtue of temperance. You know, you can talk about that, you know, and what, how, you know, he's a good illustrative case for temperance. But also, I guess the, the thing I'm interested in is how is he, you know, he's a little bit older, right? So he, he um, you know, he was kind of there at the tail end of, of the beginning of the, of the country, but he, um, such a big, powerful figure how how is he directly impacted by uh, Pythagoras specifically? You talk about that in the book, but also other uh, folks like Socrates and Cicero and, and others. So, what was the like, kind of direct impact for him and how he was trying to to do things? It's really important to see Franklin among his many towering achievements as the first major American philosophy philosopher of happiness. He was the one who set out when he was in his twenties to to read popular versions of the classic moral philosophy, distill them as aphorisms for his newspaper and uh, sum them up in poor Richard's almanac. He was the one who created this system of daily self-examination. Um, and he got that from Pythagoras. Pythagoras has uh, 76 golden verses, which are Franklin-like aphorisms, or Franklin is Pythagorean, which um, are all part of what Pythagoras recommended as daily self-examination. And Pythagoras said every night before you go to bed, you should make a enumerated list of all of your virtues and how, how you've succeeded in living up to them. And it was that that Franklin translated into his 13 virtue system. It was very striking to me, as it was for Franklin too, that Pythagoras was the innovator of the celebrated distinction between reason and passion, uh, logos and pathos, which Plato uh, translated into the three-part division between reason, yep. passion, and emotion. Reason in the head, passion, mm -hmm. or emotion in the heart, and desire in the stomach. And Plato comes up with the metaphor of the charioteer who's using reason to align the noble and appetitive parts of the soul so that all are in harmony. And Pythagoras also lives on the Isle of Croton like a god, and he encourages his disciples to first be good and then like gods by mm -hmm. following the axiom to reverence thyself. And he urges strict moderation in eating and drinking. He's a, a famous vegetarian with the notable exception mm -hmm. of beans, which he forbids his disciples to eat under all circumstances, rather die than touch a bean field, which they take quite seriously. And uh, he is. Um, a, a spiritual figure uh, for Franklin, like Socrates, who Franklin also reveres. And in his virtue, humility, which he adds to his list at the last minute, because a Quaker friend tells him that he lacks humility, Franklin has the simple injunction, imitate Jesus and Socrates. And just as Jesus told his disciples to be perfect, even as the Lord is perfect, so Socrates was a m exemplar of, of how to live a good self-mastered life according to divine reason. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, Franklin uh, admired Socrates, in, in particular Xenophon's um, Socrates, so much that a daughter of one of his friends on reading Xenophon said, Mama, uh, Socrates talks just like Dr. Franklin. And he, he loved that kind of Socratic mm. uh, dialogue and injunction and always avoiding asserting his opinions too confidently. I, it occurs to me, it may be, Franklin learned that this is far more persuasive than to be dogmatic. And that kind of compromising, temperate spirit, he attributed at the end of his life to his success. He says to his success, he owes his moderate temperament. And he mm. showed that 
temperance and moderation at the Constitutional Convention, where he persuaded contesting sides to deliberate and to compromise. And in his club for the pursuit of virtue, which he called the Junto, or to join. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Franklin is such a, a protean, dazzling genius on so many levels. It's just very striking that for him, this moral self-mastery, that this purpose-driven life was mm-hmm. crucial, and he got it from Pythagoras. Mm. Yeah, it's just so interesting uh, hearing you explain it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, it's, it's really throughout the book, and you know, all the people you kind of uh, mention and the virtues you, you kind of mention with them. It's, it's like two things are happening at the same time, right? There's the first thing of... Wow, look at all of these, you know, how great the founders were, right? And like, wow, they just, you know, were really, uh, you know, thoughtful and all these things and, you know, good role models and all this stuff. But also it's, it's the other thing too of, wow, look at how human they were too. Look at, they were just, they were average people like, you know, you or I were. And of course they're smart and brilliant and that's great. You know, visionaries, transformative of sorts, but they also struggled with a lot of real things like a lot of people do. And, you know, whether it's, you know, being able to have self-control or to be able to be more prudent or to be more, you know, whatever any of these pieces are that are, you know, more humble, uh, more temperate, you know, all these things, they each struggle in different ways. And of course, you know, for the time, you know, obviously times are different now, but generally it's, it's interesting. So it's such a, it's such a cool thing to see kind of both at the same time. We can admire and revere them, but then we can also say, yeah, they were super flawed. And they also recognize that and try to, to continue to work on themselves. It's this very interesting kind of thing happening at the same time. Absolutely. You, you put it so well. And, and of course, they're inspiring in their achievements. Um, they are striking in their hypocrisies because their ideals were high and they did not live up to them in many regards, most notably, of course, with respect to slavery, which we can talk about in a moment. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but, but they were so mindful about the struggle and they talked about it a lot. And the fa- there's something so human and ultimately both inspiring and reassuring about the fact that they're constantly beating themselves up for not having achieved enough. Mm-hmm. In, I, I think my favorite of the founding generation is John Quincy Adams, who's extraordinarily mm-hmm. hard on himself. There's that great letter. He's like, I'm 27 years old. He's just been appointed to the Supreme Court and turned down the appointment. He's ambassador to Russia. He said, I've, I've accomplished nothing. I'm completely wasting my life. If only I could be more self-disciplined. I'd go to the theater less. I'm getting fat. I'm drinking too much. You know, if, if I just had <laughs> any talent at all, as opposed to pure industry, you know, I might have ended war and slavery. He set a very high bar for himself. But as it is, he felt he was making a, a hash of his life. and. Any one of us uh, who's had a a Jewish mom, as I did, wonderful, um, inspiring parents who have put a lot of pressure on us to put pressure on ourselves, or a Puritan mom, as as John Quincy Adams did with Abigail, or Catholic, or pick your your background of of parents who have high expectations on us that we impose on ourselves. Mm -hmm. The founders are really a, a, a relatable, if I can use that word. Model mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for how um, for for the for the psychological costs of that kind of pressure, which we always impose on ourselves, but also the the, the benefits, the, the huge gift uh, that spurs us on to industry and and to always try to be better. Mm, mm, yeah, uh, that's uh, very nicely said as well. And it's it's one of those things where it's 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 something where yeah, there's a there's a kind of um, something that can kind of connect us, right? You know, as, as we go further in time and the founders aren't so far away, they're, they're still kind of relatable in a lot of ways. So you brought up uh, Quincy Adams. I, I do want to ask about uh, his, his dad, the second president, John Adams. So, you know, I think, I think it's been established to various, you know, historians have, you know, kind of examined his life. And the great thing about Adams is that he just wrote a lot and he wrote a lot of letters to his wife, Abigail and Jefferson and, so we have a, we get a good picture, and you know, th- yeah, these things like he was he was kind of short, short fuse. He had a temper and tried to keep that in check. And so you you talk about you know subduing vanity, embracing humility, and how he pulled a lot of those themes and ideas from Cicero and even maybe some of the Christian wisdom literature 
What was that like for him of these things that he were, you know, some of these virtues, the things that he was focusing on? And, um, and yeah, and, and also kind of a little bit of his relationship with, with Abigail and, and how they, there was almost like a, they, they both were in on this, right? It wasn't just him and he was doing this. Like there was a conversation that they would have about this stuff. So yeah, talk about that kind of relationship and what he was trying to, to do for himself. That's a great way to put it. They both were in on this and it's, it's moving and beautiful. Of course, they have one of the great epistolary romances and, and friendships of, of the time. And it's mm-hmm. so informed by their shared moral framework. They, they both read The Spectator, the, the London magazine that, that has this kind of classical philosophy. They've uh, read Alexander Pope um, as well as the classics themselves. And they're urging each other to new heights of self-improvement. They're, 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 they decide to be Pythagorean and make a list of each other's faults, which they enumerate, which kind of is a train wreck because Adams says that Abigail is pigeon toed and she says no gentleman should comment on the posture of a lady, you know, but, but, but they're very much in the joint project of achieving self mastery together. They've read Ben Franklin's marriage manual, manual, which recommends emotional self governance as the key to a happy marriage. Abigail is constantly saying governance over your passions is the key to happiness. And she exhorts John Quincy, their son, to practice the same wisdom. She loves to quote the proverb, he who masters himself is greater than he who taketh a village. He was slow to anger, uh, being a Mm. divine attribute from the Old Testament. Um, Mm. So um, it's, it's kind of marvelous to think about the romance, which was very much one of equals, being centrally shaped by this shared moral framework. Abigail, of course, is not allowed a Harvard education. Girl, women and girls at that time generally aren't allowed to go to university. Um, she gets it from her reading that a friend of Adam's, actually, Richard Cranch, recommended. He would give her these book lists, and she was so grateful for that, and she imbued all the wisdom. The, the wisdom led her to insist on equal rights for women, and her famous Remember the Ladies letter, she enjoins Adams to think about women's rights. He's rather dismissive of that initial request, but he does support women's education. And he, of course, has a great uh, Mm. epistolary friendship with Mercy Otis Warren, the great anti-federalist who first, um, he supports as what he calls the poetical genius of the revolution in writing classically informed satires, making fun of British Tories. Uh, he, He says that this helped you know, cement the revolutionary spirit. Then they fall out over politics. She accuses him of supporting too much consolidated government. He blows up as he often does because he's constantly struggling to keep his temper. But then they make up and Abigail brings them back together. She sends a lock of their hair to Mercy. And after the reconciliation, Adams movingly certifies that Mercy is the author of the great play, The Adulator, which someone else has claimed he wrote at the Boston Athenaeum and Adams rides to the Athenaeum and inscribes on the title page. This was written by Mercy Otis Warren. So it's, it's just Mm. a beautiful example of Adams's ability to swallow his pride. And despite the fact Mm. that he's among the most famously self regarding and vain men of his age, and he's ridiculed as his rotundity and People laugh at him because he wanted to call the president his elective majesty. He has all these pretensions and airs, and Mm -hmm. and and he rages against his enemies in the heat of battle. But he he always comes down, and he often forgives. And all of that he got from his classical reading. He practiced it with Abigail, and the the vision of him and Abigail as old. Uh, men and women and and Adams keeping up his newly rekindled epistolary friendships with Jefferson and Mercy Otis Warren is really one of the great moving moments in all of American history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's a, uh, it's easy. He, he continues to be a fascinating uh, uh, character. I mean, he's, you know, second president, only one term, but I mean, he had a pretty tough act to follow and uh, even being vice presidency and trying to figure things out. Uh, his presidency was super interesting. Uh, I'll just uh, a quick plug here. You know, uh, 
Lindsay Travinsky has a, a new biography on Adams uh, coming out later this year. So everyone should, should pick that up. And it's nice to kind of get, you know, another kind of uh, examination of, of Adams and, and other, other folks uh, in this era that we don't hear as much about. So he's, he, he continues to be very fascinating in, in your book. Um, you know, that was the, the chapter I was really interested in because we hear lots about Washington. We hear lots about Jefferson and even Madison, but uh, less about Adams and or even Monroe. And so it's, it's, it's nice to see them get their kind of uh, moments of sorts. So it's, it's very, very fascinating. So uh, Jefferson uh, is very uh, <laughs> complicated figure, of course. Um, we'll talk about slavery in a minute, but, you know, I mean, I think he's probably... What, what do people say? Cultured, right? He, he lived abroad. He loved France. He was well-read. He liked wine. He, you know, he's an inventor. He's, you know, he's, he definitely is a kind of a romantic of sorts. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, is this right? His library was like the, the, the start of the creation of the Library of Congress we have. Like, you know, it's, or it's, at least it's there. And, you know, it's like he, all of his, the guy read everything. He, he was so well-read. I mean, the guy literally read everything. Um, so you have this side of him, right? And he, you know, writes a lot of, you know, big, big part in our, our founding documents and just, you know, he's a really good writer. But it's just, you know, it's always, it's always an interesting thing because like the, you want to talk about flawed. I mean, he also is a very flawed human as well. Um, most people will be familiar with not only did he, you know, own slaves, but he had um, children with some of the slaves he, he slept with. Um, you know, I mean, how, how consensual could that be? Um, you know, I don't know. People have different ideas about this. So you just gets really messy there. Just some kind of ugly stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, and you, you treat it well in the book. So, I mean, what do we, you know, obviously he's not the only founding father that had slaves, you know, uh, he, uh, a lot of them, uh, did, um, not all, but uh, many. Yeah, what do we what do we do with Jefferson? Someone that had such good ideas, good writer, really liked culture, really liked building things, but also was kind of terrible in a lot of ways too. So, <laughs> what what do, what do we do with Jefferson? How do we understand these contradictions of sorts? It, it, we, it's, I'm it's, I'm grasping for metaphors. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I call mm -hmm. him a Chinese box who kind of was constantly compartmentalizing the various parts of his personality uh, so that he refused mm. to acknowledge the contradictions even to himself. Uh, Joe Ellis called him an American Sphinx. Uh, mm -hmm. Chief Justice uh, Marshall called him the great llama of the mountain. Mm. There, there, there's a, a ethereal quality that leads him to construct these self-justifying fantasies of a kind of temple of reason at Monticello high above the vexations of ordinary life, even as he's sustaining a life based on enslaved labor and surrounding himself with enslaved human beings, some of whom are his own children. Mm -hmm. for, for, first, let's, let, let me try as concisely as possible to, to, to acknowledge the height of his constitutional achievement as the mm -hmm. articulator of the American idea, he articulated the American idea in the Declaration of Independence, and that is uh, that all men are created equal, equality, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, natural rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, democracy, liberty, equality, democracy, all embodied in this in this act of constitutional poetry. And it's really significant that Jefferson didn't write this on his own. As he acknowledged, he was just distilling ideas that were in the air. He, he attributed them to Aristotle, Cicero, Sidney, and um, others. And in the book, I just retrace his footnotes and talk about the, the range of his reading allowed him to distill these ideas. He relied on Adams's um, thoughts on government and on James Wilson's reflections on the extent of legislative authority in Britain and on George Mason's Virginia uh, Declaration of Rights. And of course, 
Jefferson read the primary sources that those thinkers relied on, so many of whom were on his reading list. And they included all the classics, which he read in the original. He said his classical education, he would, thought was even more precious than the inheritance that he received from his father of, of land uh, and, and the Enlightenment thinkers. And he synthesized them so well that he clearly and powerfully expressed the essence of the American idea. Then he, you know, he puts three things on his tombstone, doesn't mention that he's president, but he says he's the author of the Declaration of Independence the Virginia Bill on Religious Freedom and the founder of the University of Virginia. And surely his distillation of the freedom of conscience, as he put it, the illimitable freedom of the human mind in the Virginia Bill of Religious Freedom is his second great achievement after the Declaration. And his insistence that we have a natural, unalienable right to think as we will and speak as we think, as he puts it, quoting Tacitus, and that we can't alienate or surrender our powers of, to think for ourselves because they're the product of our reason, and that no king or president or church or established religion can command us to think as we or anyone else please, is it will inscribe him into the shining history of liberty forever. And, and then, then there's his championing of education and his deep faith in democracy. And this distinguishes yeah. him from Hamilton. Uh, his political rival and uh, the antithesis of the Democratic Republican Party, which Jefferson founds, is based on the idea of the possibility of public education on a widespread and the idea that large groups of citizens yeah. can perfect themselves through self-mastery and, and reading and study so that they'll be capable of virtuous self-government. And that faith in democracy uh, is yeah. definitive for America. So I could go on, but I, I do think before we call him to account for his extraordinary hypocrisy, we really do have to acknowledge the significance of his, of his, of his achievement. The hypocrisy is, go ahead. No, no I was going to say, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that, you know, this is another thing. I mean, maybe, maybe not in the same way, of course, but we, this is a, a sort of relatable thing. We're all kind of a box of contradictions. We all have very ugly parts of us, but we have some amazing parts. We can create so much. We can be great thinkers. We can do many things. And I think that, mm, you know, obviously, you know, people can have ideas or judgments about certain figures, especially public figures or role models. And there's a, there's a, a certain hierarchy there, but um, I definitely think that there's a space of, yep. How do we acknowledge and accept and, you know, really, you know, revere. I mean, we don't have really a United States in a lot of ways without Jefferson, probably. I mean, he was so instrumental. Um, I'm not trying to make him too important here, but he's really you know, instrumental in, in a lot of ways. And we can also, at while we hold that in our head, we can also hold in our head all these other parts too. And I, I think that's just a, a really important kind of uh, lesson for us as understanding what it means to be human is that you know, we're very complicated. Uh, we do obviously, you know, or should take responsibility for actions and, you know, think belief systems. But, um, you know, I think that there's a, there's both things can kind of be true at the same time sometimes. Yes, you put it very well that uh, we can acknowledge the power of his extraordinary achievements and influence and recognize we're all human and, and incredibly flawed. The, the flaws to me, were in some ways even more jarring, shocking, really, in, in light of the high ideals. On, on mm, slavery, mm. it was really illuminating for me to see that Jefferson and the other enslavers, far from justifying their hypocrisy, acknowledged it. And Patrick Henry put it most directly. He said, is it not amazing that I myself, who thinks slavery violates natural law, my cell phone slaves, I will not justify it. I won't attempt to. It's simple avarice or greed I can't do with the inconvenience of living without it. And, mm. and, and that was Jefferson's position too. He, he put it a little less directly, but he would accuse states like South Carolina and Georgia of avarice or greed and not giving up the international slave trade immediately, which he and Virginia was willing to do because he didn't need any more imported enslaved labor. Um, uh, that was it. Je Jefferson was extraordinarily um, 
extravagant and never lived within his means and, and was, I, I call him an aestheticized shopaholic, always buying gilded mirrors <laughs> and love seats and constructing at Monticello this expensive fantasy that could only be maintained within slave labor. And he's constantly mm. saying that slavery has to end at some point in the distant future, which is constantly receding into the horizon. Um, at the end of his life, he is uh, convinced that the Missouri Compromise, which banned slavery uh, in, in the new territories, um, will break up the union. And he's coming to actually endorse secession as a necessary alternative to um, forcible ending of slavery. And the whole, his whole excuse for not freeing his own children during his lifetime was that it would be better off for them and he didn't want to pass debts along to his kids. But of course, he passed along crushing debts. All of his enslaved population had to be sold on his death. Mm. Parents separated from kids, except for his own children and keeping the promise to Sally Hemings that he'd made in Paris. He freed his own children uh, on his death. Um, the degree of his racism is really jarring, even by the standards yeah. of the other founders. Um, Washington uh, freed his enslaved population on the death of his wife and never expressed mm -hmm. racist sentiments toward for, exa toward, for example, the great Phyllis Wheatley, the black poet who Washington acclaimed as a genius and treated with respect. But Jefferson, in his notes on the state of Virginia, denigrates Wheat Wheatley's abilities, says a black poet can never be the equal of a white because blacks are intellectually inferior and is, is rabid in his, uh, in his, in his racist views. Um, and he's an anti-Semite as well, uh, in his mm. reflections on uh, the old Testament. It's just, uh, it's just shocking and, and jarring. Um, mm. so there's no absolution in in, in looking deeply into how he conceived of all this. Of course, he did conceive of race relations in classical terms. He said that slavery was bad for whites as well as blacks because it would not treat them to master their boisterous passions. And as they saw the need to physically discipline slaves, they themselves would become coarsened and would be less self-mastered. And he did acknowledge that it was just indolence and laziness and lack of frugality that led uh, wicked enslavers to rely on others mm. to do their work for them. So mm. it, it, a, a stark gap between Jefferson's ideals and his practice. And I guess it just teaches us that the ideals can be as, as soaring and inspiring as imaginable. And their author can have a terrible time living up to them in practice. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, again, it's, it's probably the, 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 the the stark contrast is just, just the most alarming between what Jefferson and, and and some of the other founders, which is it just always like any anybody that's that we really respect uh, and 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 like and admonish, you know, and then they have all these other parts. It just makes it always difficult for 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 people afterwards. Um, so I guess the the other question I have is is about Washington. I guess the question I have with him is, you know, Washington even by. Um, a lot of historians, I mean, even, even I think, uh, Ron Chernow was, you know, in his last, you know, the, the, the big biography he wrote in Washington, I guess it's, you know, almost 10 years ago now, um, is, uh, you know, kind of, there's a lot of mystery around him. He's sort of an enigma, like, yeah, you know, during his time alive and afterwards, and we don't have everything he wrote and things like that, but how much of an impact were any of the the kind of ancient thinkers, but especially Seneca on Washington and, and learning how to manage, you know, kind of self uh, command and restraint and things like that. It was central, and and Washington, uh, for me, came out even better as a result of the mm. classical framework. Um, just as Jefferson came out worse, Ron Chernow's biography is, is marvelous in painting yeah. how central self mastery was to his success, and Chernow attributes it partly to his overly critical mother who was always nagging him and telling mm. him he wasn't good enough and he would just bristle at her and, and his constant effort to control himself with his mom led to this lifelong effort to control himself with regard to the world. And he got mm. that only, not only from his mom, but from Seneca, which he read as a kid. The Seneca letters, um, including his letters on time and how to use time well, 
which is the source actually of the famous line that Shakespeare quoted, what fools these, but by time mm. is alone repaid by industry by squandering it, what fools these mortals be. Um, Seneca is a great uh, first uh, reading for, for listeners who want to check out the ancient philosophy in an accessible way. Mm. Um, it, it led to Washington to a lifelong focus on timepieces. He had clocks everywhere. He kept a really rigid schedule. And, mm. and his political leadership came from his self-mastery. Jefferson said that prudence was his greatest attribute. He had a strong temper, but he always usually managed successfully to control it. He was only seen losing his temper in public on a few occasions. And there are these defining moments like at Newburgh where the troops are mutinying and there's a danger that they'll rise up against him because Congress won't pay them for their revolutionary war over time. And Washington mounts the temple of virtue, as the stage is called. Uh, mm. And after a performance of Cato's Letters, his favorite classical piece, um, struggles to put on his reading glasses as he tries to read a speech he's composed for the occasion, urging the troops to engage in self-mastery. And then he famously says, you know, forgive me, gentlemen, I've grown almost uh, uh, gray and now almost blind in your service. And people weep because it's such a human expression of frailty. Um, but always within the context of this deeply controlled, self-composed, almost theatrical conception of enacting what it means to be a self-mastered leader. Uh, so yeah. he embodies for America what virtuous Republican self-mastery can mean. And then he exhorts yeah. citizens to practice it in his farewell address where he says, unless we as citizens can master our turbulent emotions, will descend into factions and the Republic will fall like Greece and Rome. And, uh, and, and that farewell address uh, urges the establishment of a national university to teach the habits of self-mastery and democratic deliberation so that people from around the country can set aside their sectional prejudices and deliberate together. Mm. Uh, mm. There's always a debate about, you know, was Washington so great? And in Henry Adams's Democracy, the, the novel of the American idea, there's a scene where the protagonist and her friends are outside Mount, Mount Vernon on a boat, and they're looking at Mount Vernon and debating the meaning of Washington, which they say is the meaning of America. Was Washington really so great? If he's not, then America is a lie. If he was, then the American idea is real. And, and when you realize that greatness for Washington was self-mastery, self-discipline, composure, then you realize that he was nearly as great as he was meant out to be. Mm. Yeah, it, it is interesting. He does. He does kind of. He does get better with with understanding him in the context of the, the thinkers, which is which is. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't think that was possible, but <laughs> it's a nice. It's a nice backdrop. Yeah. Um, one of the 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 other interesting components here is so I'm a big Hamilton fan. Um, I like Hamilton a lot. He's probably my favorite founding father. Uh, he also, I mean, personally, he had his own uh, his own challenges as well. Um, but you have a chapter of of, of uh, Hamilton and Madison together, and how moderation was such a critical virtue for both of them in you know the Constitution with you know, the financial system, all these things what they were doing. And you also mentioned um, some of their inspirations as well. Um, how do we see moderation? as such a critical um, component for, mm, I think, people generally, but then also as a country that we, we're not doing extremes, that we're not doing any of these things. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you see the role of, of moderation from, from these two figures? I will answer that in a sec, but first I have to ask, why is Hamilton your favorite founding father? <laughs> I like Hamilton. Uh, I think he's a genius financially. I mean, what was it? Three months he created our financial system or, or less than that or whatever it was. I think he's brilliant. I think the fact that he comes from the Caribbean is interesting. Is an interesting backstory in that way. But also, I mean, he's to me the person that, I mean, maybe a little bit more than I would because he had some interesting ideas about a monarchy and things like that. But this idea of trying to 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 regulate um uh, things in a country or how you're trying to do things in a country has to be through strong centralized federal government. 
and you can't otherwise you splinter too much and that there's a thread that has to tie things together and i just firmly believe that we need to have those things then and now and and that's what makes a good uh, vibrant you know country kind of hold hold together it's a kind of glue of sorts uh you know it can be imperfect obviously there can be things that need to be um amended time to time but i think you need to have that and just very you know how systematic it was and how organized and so those kind of big big picture things those are the reasons why for me um, you know, he, he had that piece of it, but then he also was passionate about that belief, right? He didn't just kind of say, you know, I see Washington as like the true independent, right? He's just kind of, yeah, you know, he's hearing everything and then he'll just kind of come in at the end and say, here's, here's what we should do, or here's the decision or okay. Or he would defer to people, but you know, Hamilton was passionate and he believed strongly and would make his case and make good arguments and. Um, so I just find how he did it and kind of what he was, what he was talking about in, in, uh, for the country, both, both financially and just kind of more generally, again, I think he's super underrated and super tremendous for how our country still does things and in, in the way in which we do things. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's like kind of the, those are the biggest reasons why I, why I love Hamilton. I'm so glad I asked. You put so well his greatness, <laughs> um, his devotion to union as the mm-hmm. uh, engine for our joint success and achieving common purposes and the need for a strong federal government as, w- as well as the mm-hmm. passion and the, um, create, the genius of creating the financial system and the immigrant mm-hmm. background. So my next book is actually how the debate between Hamilton and Jefferson over Union versus states' mm. rights has defined oh, all American nice. history, and it's really oh, strange. Nice. It's kind of an obvious theme, but it, just bringing it together is meaningful, and it's incredible mm. how explicitly both Hamilton and Jefferson were invoked throughout American history, each on mm. usually both sides of the same question, depending on whether their stock had risen or fallen. But that <laughs> that theme just proves to be central, and I'm having mm. a lot of fun with it. No, that's great. Yeah, um, moderation is more of a theme of the Federalist Papers. Obviously, it's not. Uh, Mm -hmm. unique to Hamilton. He shared it with Madison. Mm -hmm. Um, And Madison was the great apostle of moderation in between Mm -hmm. Jefferson's uh, states' rights and strict construction and Hamilton's devotion to union and and liberal construction. Madison was always finding the middle way. But in the Federalist Papers, they did both converge around this uh, vision of a constitution that mirrored in its faculties the same faculties or powers of the human mind, and just they're they're getting this from their youthful reading. Just as the uh, individual is supposed to find balance between the appetitive and passionate parts of the soul, so the Constitution is supposed to find balance and harmony between the appetitive and passionate parts of the state. And they thought of the mm-hmm. executive and the and the legislature and the Senate and the House as mirroring these various parts of the soul, and the whole system is designed to check mm. passionate mobs and they're both mm. very concerned about Shay's rebellion the uprising of debtors in western massachusetts who refuse to pay their debts they want to slow down deliberation so there's no direct democracy and mobs can't find each other easily and by the time they do they'll get tired and go home they're centrally concerned about demagogues and they fear that uh demagogues like caesar will flatter mobs who will then be duped into exchanging their liberty for entertainment and will allow uh, popular demagogues to set them up as autocrats. And they are determined to create a system that presumes that people are not angels, uh, but that they have some capacity for virtue in them and will uh, use the theory of what Hamilton calls, in a wonderful phrase, the counteracting passions to ensure that rather than trying to eliminate ambition and avarice, uh, ambition is made to counteract ambition, as Madison said, and um, through the check, checks and balances and the vertical divisions of federalism, uh, cool reason can slowly prevail. It's The Federalist Papers are, are the most uh, authoritative and inspiring 
vision of what the Constitution meant, because that was the time when Hamilton and Madison are united around the nationalist project. And mm. the, their later divisions about the scope of national and state power will break out over the Alien and, and Sedition Acts and, mm -hmm. and then uh, in the nullification controversies leading up to the Civil War, where, where Madison significantly, when forced to choose, uh, re repudiates nullification and says that states can't on their own refuse to enforce federal laws or leave the Union. Jefferson never took that step. So, um, but coming back to your initial thought, Hamilton in some ways is the most, he certainly, the reason that he was the founder who got the musical is because he's the most passionate <laughs> and has the most trouble mm -hmm. controlling mm -hmm. his own ambition, avarice, lust with the Reynolds mm -hmm. affair. And he's so hypersensitive to slights throughout his life that he breaks up with his own mentors. He, he theatrically, uh, you know, runs away from Washington because Washington he thought disrespected him on a staircase in a crazy act of self-sabotage. He lashes out against John Adams and suggests mm -hmm. he'd rather have Jefferson win the election of 1800. And he famously uh, denounces Burr as a demagogue a decade before the fatal interview. So that, that, and, and cause he always wants to wreak himself onto the fame of the world like a sunbeam he, he 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 as a kid he says i want a war neddy he writes to his friend ned so that he can become famous and win the the justified fame that the classical people thought comes from heroism on the battlefield and he wins it he is a hero at the battle of monmouth and elsewhere so gosh what a you know what a large character who just blazes brightly during his brief lifetime and then ends in violence. Uh, but his legacy in the Federalist Papers is this great vision of moderation and counteracting passions. And for the rest of American history is a vision of strong central authority and of union that will mm. inspire Lincoln and devotion, devotees of union ever since. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, he, he lived life, uh, to the fullest in a lot of ways, <laughs> maybe sometimes where it's very foolish for him, but, um, you know, the way he died is, you know, obviously the, the duel with Burr and, you know, but honestly, I mean, you know, it, 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 it it's, it doesn't sound so, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're going to go out one way, you know, that's how Hamilton would go out kind of in that way. He's not going to be 95, you know, writing letters to Adams or something like Jefferson did or whatever. He's, he, he kind of did go out, you know, with a bang, if you will. Right. He's, he's one of those people that's just, yeah, he lived life to the fullest in some ways. But, and so it's interesting mm, that there's some insight, I think about that. You know, you see that in the Federalist papers. I always see that there's, um, mm, I always see the Federalist papers as kind of like a how to of like how to do government. Right. You know, <laughs> you know, not exactly, but, they're so interesting. They're so fascinating uh, to read and to really get more of the kind of you know uh, ideas behind what we have in in our founding documents. They, they they are a how to, and they're a how to for public happiness. That's the phrase that both <laughs> Madison mm -hmm. and Hamilton use a lot. It's mm -hmm. literally if if the Tusculan Disputations of Cicero are a how to manual for private happiness. The Federalist Papers are for public happiness. Mm -hmm. The way to do it is mm -hmm. the structures that uh, mm -hmm. the Constitution created. Yeah, and I think that, you know, when I think about things today, I think about why institutions are super important and essential, imperfect as they are, but why they're really important. And I think it's that point. I think it's that, that, that major, major element there. Which brings me to my, my last question is, you, 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 told us about all these virtues, the ancient thinkers, our founding fathers. Um, so the, the biggest question is, <laughs> our, our politics today is a mess, right? It is a mess. It is a big, big mess. We're in an election year, which is also a mess. Um, <laughs> there's so many things. And I just feel... Like if people and politicians and, you know, people running for office, if they took 10% of some of these, these things you discussed in your book, it would be a little bit better. It'd be just a little bit better. Um, so how do we, 
what are these major lessons you think from from your book or things that you you were kind of uh, researching for writing the book that we can take for for us uh, uh, as as an electorate, but also for our our leaders as well? Well, as you say, it's an extremely serious and challenging time, and in many ways, these times represent the, the founders' nightmares. They're, they're all the things yeah. they most feared: yeah. popular demagogues inciting mm-hmm. factions to use violent insurrection to break up the union was was their central concern. Madison and Jefferson mm-hmm. and Hamilton yeah. shared it, and and factions of that are passionate rather than based on reason were a central concern. And and even more significantly, uh, reason itself is under assault. And both social media with its enraged to engage model and the fact that posts based on unreason and turbulent emotion travel further and faster than those based on reason, um, it makes the founders hope that people could achieve self-mastery and virtue on a wide scale look overly optimistic. It's it's really striking that, that Madison was so... Uh, optimistic about a new technology, the broadside press that he thought would slowly diffuse reason across the land as a new class of journalists he called the literati would kind of write complicated arguments like the Federalist Papers and people would deliberate about them and talk about them with their representatives and and, and the cool voice of reason would slowly prevail. And obviously mm. the age of X and TikTok is very, very different. Mm. Um, so it's, it, it, you can call it a existential challenge or a structural one, but it's not enough just, oh, if only politicians would read more Cicero, although that could be a great thing, just in general reading more deep reading uh, on the part of politicians and citizens is indeed an urgent need. But but the structural uh, t- and technological changes that have undermined the speed bumps and roadblocks that the constitution makers set up to slow down deliberation and then the new technologies of media that that are engines of unreason are, are very serious. They, they they're not going to be solved by any single politician or any single voter. And it's striking that at the end of their lives, the founders were not sure that the system would succeed. And Madison is maybe the most optimistic because he expects less of the system. But Hamilton, Adams, Washington, Jefferson are, are deeply uh, concerned that the people. Mm-hmm will not be able to find self-mastery on a wide enough scale and that demagogues will prevail. So mm. um, on that score, we'll see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's lots to, lots to look at. And, you know, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, you know, no one's ever really happy with their choices, but, you know, you, you, you get the choices you have and you, you should, people should make the best one. So hopefully we can, we can avoid the things the founders were hoping to avoid. Um, Jeffrey, this was so much fun. I love talking history. I love talking politics. I love talking uh, good virtues. So it's just a combination of all of these things in one. So uh, big, big thanks for for coming on and talking about your wonderful book. And um, and, uh, yeah, I I wish you you all the best. So big thanks. Big thanks. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And thanks for all you're doing to inspire honest and authentic conversation. The diversity of thought and opinions. What a meaningful mission for converging dialogues. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.